welcome back guys for another episode of pro view today before i uh, introduce the uh, guest let me welcome my co-host amit sir thank you so much and uh, for all the viewers in advance wish you a merry christmas yes merry christmas in advance and today we have a very special guest a good friend of mine i had the privilege of traveling with him uh let me introduce philip ross to you welcome philip hi philip hey guys uh firstly thank you pro view for having me and thank you amit and mohan uh for being the ho- the host and i can't wait to get this thing going yeah we are really uh, so happy and it is our pleasure to have you here in this show uh, philip awesome mohan yeah philip i n- i never met you in past but uh, one image of yours philip which always there on on my mind and that is that blacky which is turning back and giving you the look in fact uh, when me and mohan sir met uh, we were part of the documentary mudumalai Uh-huh. uh we were always remembering you because first four days we couldn't get any sighting or any signs of that blacky fortunately we got it on the last day but that one image of yours is always there you know and yes. uh, philip your work on western guards okay always fascinates me because uh, your feeds on instagram keeps uh, motivating me to go back to shoot you know in western guards because not only mammals i think lot of frogs snakes i mean you shoot everything there right Yep. uh so guys uh, uh without any further delay i mean i want philip to take us through his beautiful work uh in and around bangalore and especially western guards right philip awesome amit yep you said it all so uh thank you once again guys and uh, for everyone listening i hope you get to take home a little bit of uh an understanding of where i go and travel a few tips and tricks on photography but also uh some cool moments that i'd like to share with you all about my experiences and uh, yeah uh, like like amit said that special sighting i had of a black panther way back in 2013 in mudumalai i want to give you all the the cool uh, information about it and how i saw it and all the entire experience and just to get you guys totally engrossed in this talk okay so anyway guys welcome aboard and i hope you guys are going to understand some really cool things about my wild journey through the western ghats so it was back in 2005 when my dad first got me a camera and uh i was absolutely fascinated by the whole world of photography then because it was something new to me it was a very bit, it was very basic equipment but yet i wanted to go out and explore this thing so i started to travel to different places around bangalore itself from my favorite jaunt at that point which is bihar hills to bandipur to kabini etc and it was a really cool way of learning because it was completely uh learning through your mistakes there was no real online photography course at that point in time youtube was just new there was no real mentorship ha- uh, courses happening etc so it was all of me learning by myself and learning through uh some of the other guys who were into the world of wildlife photography but wildlife for me guys started ever since i remember so i grew up in a family in bangalore that absolutely loved wildlife i think every molecule of my mom and dad breathes wildlife and it was passed on by their parents so my grandfather grew up in bangalore in the 40s and 50s and uh, he he was close friends with the, with the late kenneth anderson uh, donald anderson etc they would do plenty of trips all around uh, bangalore on various hunts etc and that sort of um, wild experience was passed on to my father who then started passing around to me so i remember ever since i was like 2 and 3 years old we would go out on drives to places like bandipur places like uh nagarhole uh, uh in around uh, bangalore itself like banwagata and it was such an amazing feeling getting introduced to this whole world of wildlife at a super super young age in fact for all of you guys listening the the banwagata zoo right now a part of it belonged to the ross family uh we owned a section of the park or rather my grandfather and his aunt and his, his brother uh, owned a section of the park right now and uh, that's where my my dad used to be taken all the time when he was young so it was his dream to sort of take uh, his kids out to banagata and of course he also wanted to own some land in banagata so unfortunately we lost that property um, to the government the government acquired it when they were setting up the zoo etc but uh, before that it was an amazing 
a little uh, place called the Ross Farm. In fact, I remember my uncles telling me way back in the 1960s, uh, they had this fabulous tiger sighting right on that Banagata Hill itself. So okay. just on the other side of the hill, um, they, they had they, my, 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 my uncle Graydon and who were right now in Australia, they were, they were walking up that side of the hill and they saw this huge tiger walking towards them on the other side. Okay. So I remember vivid stories like that. And, and at that point in time, when I used to visit Banagata, there was no tiger at that point in time. So I always was trying to picture how it could have been at that point in time when there was more wildlife, uh, when there was, uh, you know, this really, really cool wilderness uh, without too much of human interference, etc. how the park would have been then. And that sort of drew me even closer to Banagata. So I remember when I was growing up and I just got into photography after 2015, we would go out on drives on the, on the Banagata road itself and go on a slight offshoot road called the Ragi Hali Road. And we would drive over there and occasionally we would see things like elephants. Now, this is one of some of my earlier pictures from 2005 uh, when, 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 the, uh, when there was less traffic on that road. So you would see these water holes and sometimes on, in, on, on, on a lovely evening, you would see a herd of elephant or a herd of gore or some spotted deer and we would get quite excited. So we would go on these drives looking for uh, looking for wildlife and like I said, we would see elephants like this or maybe we would even climb up a small hill where we'd get this fantastic panoramic view of the entire bit of Banagata and uh, we came across these amazing herds of elephant come to these water holes to drink water. And you can see this is the typical habitat of Banagata, very dry deciduous forest. And all this time when we used to go on these drives, my dad kept on saying, you know what, Philip, when we, when we were younger, we would see a lot more than this. Apart from the only seeing elephants, we would also see a sloth bear come to drink water. We would see barking deer. We would see herds of samba. And I was like, wow, just imagine it in the 1970s and 80s, just before, uh, you know, uh, Bangalore started rapidly uh, getting more uh, bigger and there was more use of granite, et cetera, and more quarrying was happening, et cetera. That really took a, a huge uh, sort of uh, blow to the wildlife in the area. But I was really determined to, to see Banagara come back to its, to its beautiful state. And my dad at that point in time decided to fulfill his childhood dream of picking up his own bit of property and we converted to our own farmhouse. So this is our farm in Banagara, guys. You can see we're on the border of the, the national park. We're on the border of the forest. So this hill is a part of the forest. Mm -hmm. This bit of land out here is a part of our property, but it left wild. And that's the cool thing about it. So in this little private bit of property, Property that we have, we have a little bit of our own private jungle. And in that jungle, we, I started exploring. And that's how I started to hone my naturalist skills. I started picking up on birding, etc. And I started going out there to look for wildlife. And in the process, I came across some amazing, uh, uh, amazing wildlife. Like, for example, one, one evening we were sitting out near the water and I saw this action happening all on top of the water. So, um, you know, when you're a young boy of, uh, say, 17, 18, and you see all this action on the water, you get ready with your camera. I ran out there and I saw this uh, checkered keelback feeding on a fish. And uh, initially there was a lot of action on top of the water and the fish was trying to vigorously try to move itself so it could escape from the jaws of the snake. But luckily the, the, the keelback had a strong grip on it, came out to the bank and then started to swallow this, this fish whole. And to me, sighting stuff like that was just incredible. So um, this, this was an incredible sighting that one of the incredible sightings that I've had of the many. And um, I remember on one of the evenings as well, one of my friends went to use the bathroom. We had a, a little get together at the farm and one of my friends went to use the bathroom and in the windowsill, he shouts, snake, snake, snake. Mm -hmm. So uh, immediately I, I went to have a look at the snake and it was lodged in the windowsill. It obviously gotten somehow. So I tried to rescue it and remove it and release it. And I took a picture of this. Now this is this snake guys call the yellow green cat snake or the boiga flabby viridis. Mm -hmm. Now, guys, this picture was taken in 2007, okay? But this snake was only described in 2013. Oh. So that's the incredible thing about wildlife photography. And when you start exploring lesser known areas, you start exploring things on foot, and when you get the access to, you can actually find stuff that probably isn't even described to science. Like what I did when I saw this snake in 2007, even at that point in time, I remember sending these pictures out to uh, the great Jerry Martin uh, and Ashok Kapner, who said, do you have the individual with you? Uh, can we try and come and look for it? Because this doesn't match any of the scale counts or the, the, the morph of the cat snakes we, are know, we, are, we have known to science. So only in 2013, this particular cat snake was described. So it was one of those crazy things for me 
in my journey uh, at Bangladata, which was really, really awesome. But what really, really struck me in the right accord and got me going into this world of wildlife was birds. And because Bangladata is not a very rich park for mammals, you have to really go looking a lot. You have to be super, super lucky to see a, a, a mammal. Birding, on the other hand, is fantastic. From key species like the yellow-throated bulbul, rufous belly eagle, and some amazing waterfowl that comes in in the winter, Bangladata is just one super heaven. And what got me going was this sort of small project that I took about to sort of make a checklist of all the birds mm -hmm. I used to see. So what I did was I took a, 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 an attendance register, like my mom and dad were doing for their employees. I bought another attendance register. And in the year 2004, 2005, I used to write down the names of the birds I would oh. see on the days I would travel <laughs> to the farm. So I was kept on writing down the names of the birds. And also, if you look at the bottom, I also took down a note of all the mammals I would see. So you can see on June 10th of 2004, I saw a baby black naped hare. On 15th, I saw a mongoose on the farm itself. And on the 9th, I saw a leopard on the main road. So you can see this is how I documented everything that I, I, that I, was, I, I was observing in that park. So what, so, is the final, what is the final number on this? So my, <laughs> my personal uh, sort of database is two, 202 species of birds. Wow. wow. And that's just 30 kilometers away from Bangalore. And uh, it's, in, it's incredible. So even one of the species that I got to, to document was never ever described from the area. And that was the, uh, the, view, uh, the, the um, spot-bellied eagle owl uh, or the forest eagle owl. This, this, this eagle owl was never believed to be a part of the, um, of the Banagara landscape. And uh, when I saw it, I said, oh my God, this is some really, really cool find. Immediately it came out in the papers after it sort of went viral on INW. Uh, INW is when I used to post my images at that point in time. I think all of us, Ooh, yeah. including you guys, uh, would, would be posting your images there. And I, and I went over there and um, when, I, when I saw the bird, I knew it was a special bird. And this was one of the lists that, I, one of the birds that I added to everyone's bird list. Whoever was maintaining a bird list of Banagara, this is one of that uh, birds that everyone's happened to look out for, uh, this bird. But what was really cool about this entire work of doing this, this survey was I put together this entire chart of the birds of Banagara, firstly the species list. Then I also put together a list of the 10 most common species of birds you'll see throughout the year. Mm -hmm. I put together the, a list of the winter birds that normally come at what periods of time, like I know just after the month or just before the monsoon, you'll get the Jacobian cuckoo. Uh, then you start getting the brown shrike, the gray wagtail, and all. I started making a list of all these birds. And I submitted this little report to the forest department just, just for for fun. I didn't even do it for any sort of, uh, you know, reward or whatever. But thanks to uh, a very uh, good DFO in the area who was doing a lot of good work setting up anti-poaching camps. Her name is Vanishri. She actually gifted me a, a very prestigious award called the Karnataka Forest Department, a, a special service award uh, at that point in time in 2009. So that was one incredible thing that I got to do in the region of Banvagata. Uh, but as years started getting more and more uh, better with my photography skills, etc. I realized that obviously I want to get slightly dig deeper into the heart of Bangladesh birding, and I set set myself up a bird hide. So at the bird hide at the farm, we started getting these really cool things like red spur fowl. We started getting all the other common birds like your yellow browed uh, babbler, your yellow yellow eyed babbler. Uh, we started getting so cool things like tickled blue flycatchers, etc. Coming right up to the hide. And today onwards, what I do is uh, we, run the, we run the farm as a small farm stay and we invite people only over the weekends to come and share this experience with us, to get to know more about Banagata, to stay away from the, you know, everyone thinks of Banagata is just the zoo and just a drive to the zoo and back, but there's so much more. Once you get to explore the region, I'm telling you, you will fall head over heels over the park. And uh, there's a lot of cool stories we tell people about our experiences over there, how we were sitting around the campfire and we heard this leopard sawing how I recently heard the tiger calling, how we even camera trapped the tiger, we camera trapped the leopard. So there's one tiger that roams around now, Amit and Mohan. Um, wow. uh, since 2015, all of a sudden, Forest Department talks about these bug marks that they saw mm -hmm. um, uh, in, in a place called the Anakal Beat. And we were like, what, really? And then they found a, they found a, a, a gore kill with clear um, signs of a tiger being there. And then eventually the Forest Department managed to camera trap uh, the tiger just one kilometer from our property. Wow. So just one kilometer from the property, they set up a camera trap uh, in this place called Gulati Belt and they got the tiger finally. So it was confirmed. Unfortunately, there's only one of them right now. So he's a big male. He's a huge male that moves around the area. 
Um, he moves quite frequently. So the, the entire park's his own right now. But I only hope in the future, thanks to a little bit of protection by the park, there's more and more anti-poaching camps being set up, like I said. Uh, Sanjay Gubi and his organization are doing a lot of work with camera trapping the area, etc. So I hope with this protection that's being given to the park right now, uh, maybe in the future, this guy will go and bring another female in the area and they'll start having cubs and then finally the population will go back to how it was when my grandfather spoke of Banagata. Mm-hmm. So, I mean. so this is so my journey into Banagata and how I fell in love with the place. And I, like I told you, a lot of people take Banagata for granted, but mm. once you go and explore the area properly and spend time over there, my gosh, it's one awesome joint. Okay, super cool. So obviously Banagata was this place for birds, etc. But I had to go and photograph mammals. I love big cats like Mohan does. I know his his work on big cats is supremely awesome. Uh, like you as well, Amit, you go out to all these really cool places. I, I know you, I've seen a lot of stuff from Corbett from you as well. So uh, for me, Southern Indian big cats drew a lot of attention to me. And, and in, at the time of 2007, 2008, 2009, one place that was really doing well for big cats was Bandipur. Mm. Thanks to two particular tigers. One being Prince and the other being Gauri. These two tigers, guys, were putting Bandipur on the map worldwide because uh, especially this guy, Prince, he would, uh, once you see him, he was the most habituated tiger of South India for sure. You would leave him and once, once the safari timing ended, you will have to leave and go. He'll still be there wherever he is. Oh, he'll just keep walking on the road and go on and on and on and on. And likewise was Gauri. Gauri was one female that was so bold. Um, and she had a very, very nice area, a very uh, good area where there was a lot of open areas. Uh, you know, the nice, that Wesley Road area where she would walk, um, uh, you know, Huli uh, Katte and all these other cool places where she would come out at was just the most crazy places to see her because you can make those wonderful backgrounds. And these are pictures with my old equipment. So I started off with the Nikon D70 and the 7300. That was what I started off with. And, you know, you grow, you reach saturation very quickly, especially if you're passionate with photography you will realize that your camera is only reached a certain point quite quickly. You need to start moving on. And at that point of time, for the budget that I had, I wanted something in that range of 400 mm. So it was between the 100-400 Canon uh, lens, the IS lens, or the 80-400 Nikon lens. Mm. Now, the Canon lens had had the better IS, had the better uh, sort of feel compared to the 80-400. So I went in and shifted brands at that point in time itself. Sorry, all you Nikon <laughs> lovers, but I shifted brands <laughs> and, and moved to Canon. Um, and uh, that's when I started shooting with this 100-400. And you can see this picture of Gauri, even though it was with 100-400, because of those backgrounds being so beautiful in Bandipur, being so far away, even then you would get this lovely, beautiful, shallow depth of field, which was really wonderful in certain cases. So it was amazing going out and exploring uh, Bandipur, thanks to these two. But... Their reign lasted till about 2012. I think uh, um, 2012, 2013 is when Prince, his area started growing really, really large. He, he took over the entire tourism zone and he, it was such a large area. I think Bandipur compared to Kabini or anywhere has a much larger tourism zone. So you could travel like really, really long and you would never be able to cover the entire area. So Prince could have been in the Moya Valley. He could have been near... Uh, border road, he could have been near uh, was this Gopal Swami better as well. He was just such a massive area that he had. So his sighting started reducing. But in the process, their the fruits of their labor, all their 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 children and their grandchildren started taking over their areas of the park. So there was this one beautiful sighting I had of this beautiful male um, called the Betat Kate male at that point in time. And he was this beautiful young tiger at that point in time when I saw him sitting right on the road. And it was an incredible sighting. In fact, uh, Amit and Mohan, if you ever go and look at the new uh, Bandipur logo that the forest department is using, it's of this very image. So they've actually taken and made a little cut out of the image wow. and they've used it as their logo. Congratulations, so, congratulations, Mohan. <laughs> it's, it's a part of the Bandipur logo. But yeah, this is, this is one tiger that um, hasn't been seen for some time now, but he started to take over the part of the, the Mulapura area of Bandipur. And of course, later on, uh, another side, on the other side of the park, there's a place where there are three little water holes called Murkere. And this is one female that re- really used to rule the roost in that particular area called the Murkere female. So she used to roam, roam around over there. And slowly, as it started getting between 2011 and 12, 13, 14 on, onwards, uh, sightings started to slightly 
reduced because all these tigers weren't as habituated as Prince and Gauri. Mm. Also, because we were so used to such crazy two-hour sightings of Prince and Gauri, suddenly Bandipur felt like, if you have one five-second tiger sighting, it felt like, oh, there's no tiger sighting on you. It was, it was like that because of the amount that, that Prince and Gauri spoiled us in Bandipur. Like especially, all, I think even Mohan had those insane sightings of Gauri walking head-on uh, towards her and stuff. So it was, it was just, we were blessed at that point of time. Um, in 2014 and 15, there was another big male that took over the area. Mm-hmm. Uh, this uh, big, big male called the Baswan Kate male uh, was another very, very large male, the tiger that used to ra- roam around that area. And once again, um, he started becoming like Prince, uh, taking over the entire tourism area. His area became really large. And unfortunately, he's not being seen right now. So we don't know whether he's moved out to another region of the park or uh, thanks to those really crazy forest fires that happened in Bandipur a couple of years ago, right? We don't know if that could have been the reason why he's moved out or what had succumbed to it as well. We're not sure what happened. And of course, the new queen of Bandipur, I think that most people want to see right now, is a, is a female called the Kadamutur Kate female. They locally call her Sundari as well. Yes. Now, uh, yeah, this, this tigress is just like her grandmother, uh, which is Gauri. Uh, and uh, she is just an absolutely gorgeous female. And uh, if you get to see her, you know, one of the few vehicles, she usually shows herself for quite some time. So this is one evening when we were driving through the park. It was just about 4.15 uh, in the evening. It was slightly backlit. And out she pops out and starts walking straight towards us for about maybe three kilometers. It was just a wonderful evening spent with her. So Bandipur is this sort of really cool, was this really cool spot for tigers as the tiger capital of South India for sure. But people were not only seeing tigers, you were seeing lots of other stuff from amazing elephant sightings to amazing gore sightings. Uh, even birding was fairly good. I remember if you go out in the morning safaris, you'll get the most amazing jungle fowl images, uh, most crazy peacock uh, on display images, etc. So it was, it was a wonderful destination to go to. But leopards also played a very, very nice role in Bandipur. Mm-hmm. I remember coming across this big, big male leopard very close to the reception itself. In fact, um, I used to call him the jaguar of leopards because just look at the size of his rosettes in the middle oh, part of the body. Just absolutely massive rosettes. I don't think I've ever seen a, a leopard in, in, in my lifetime, in, in South India especially, with, uh, with uh, rosettes this large. They were really, really big um, uh, rosettes for this particular individual. And another crazy leopard sighting I had was one New Year day. It was back in 2011. Yeah, 2011. We had entered the park and um, uh, I remember we, at that point in time, Jungle Lodge was not the only sole operators of doing safaris. Uh, you, you could go with a, with a place called Tusker Trails. Uh, you could go with a place called MC Resorts, etc. But I used to prefer going with Tusker Trails because they used to have gypsies. Mm. You know how right now everyone goes in boleros and all that, slightly noisier. Uh, at that point in time, we would go in gypsies and it was more silent and plus it was slightly more open as well. So I was, I was with my friends and, a, and another family who were put in our vehicle. And uh, this family had a small child, unfortunately. But, but yeah, the, the child was enjoying uh, herself uh, as we started the safari, etc. And, um, you know, for all of us, whenever we go into that golden hour time between 5 o'clock in the evening till about 6.15, every turn we take in the park, we're like, I hope something's there, I hope something's there, right? So I remember our driver, Chelva, he takes his right on the road and right down the road, I spot this leopard, a young leopard sitting on the road, looking back at us. So I told the driver, stop, stop, leopard, leopard. And um, I they popped my camera out to the side with a, with a gun, the 100, 400 itself, a Canon lens. And uh, through the distance, it was quite far away. I took some pictures and I zoomed and I could clearly see these amazing blue eyes. Whoa. Okay, so I told everyone, guys, guys, leopard, leopard, there's a beautiful leopard, called, uh, it's a blue eyed leopard. This is on a, on a road called Border Road. It was, uh, uh, it was a very, very, not, it was not very well used at that time. So it was not a very habituated leopard. It was a leopard that I knew was going to be quite shy. So luckily for us, um, from where we saw the leopard to where the leopard was, it was a down slope. So I told Chelva, don't start the car, just be clutch and roll down this hill to where the leopard is. So as soon as he started moving towards it, the leopard gets up and goes off inside. Typical, right, of what would happen to most core zone leopards or most uh, sightings it would happen close to the core area. So this leopard w- walked off into the lantana and was hiding somewhere there. Anyway, we decided to roll down to the spot where the leopard ro- walked into and we waited for about five minutes, 10 minutes. 
Then I realized that what we're doing is we're probably doing a mistake by waiting at the exact spot where the leopard went in. Maybe we should just go and drive slightly forward because in front of us was a was another little bit of a mound and then another big downhill. So I thought if we go and wait at that second high uh, mound, then we could see what's in front of us and see what's right behind us, right? So we were like, okay, um, let's let's do this. All this time though, I didn't know that the gypsy had a starter problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, so every time he tried to crank the engine, it would this solid, loud, kank sound would emit from the, from the engine. So he tried to start it once and this kank comes out. So I said, oh man, whatever. Little chance we had of sighting a, 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 a very, very uninhabited leopard would be gone. I, I'm sure this leopard from now in Bandipur will definitely be <laughs> <in the sky. laughs> Okay, would have gone to Budhubalai. So this guy says, sorry, sir, sorry, sir, let me try and start it once again. So he tries to start it the second time, and once again, kank, this loud sound emits from the engine. But I kid you not, guys, for some reason, I don't know what I'm assuming, but this leopard probably thought that sound of that cranking engine was some animal in distress or something. It actually ran out of that very, very bush it went into and came and stopped about maybe 10 feet from the car and just crouched looking back at us. <laughs> it came running right out there, crouched and looked at us. Now, I immediately popped my side. I was next to the driver. I said, next to the driver. I popped myself out of the driver's uh, from, the, from the side and shot from the top. And this was a picture taken at 100 mm with the 100, 400 mm lens. So that's how, that's how close it is. Catch those crazy eyes, man. But, but those, those crazy eyes looking back at us. And it was just for these three or four seconds. It ran out, stopped, looked, wondered what this sound is. says, oh, shit, these guys only. And then it ran back and went back into the, into the forest. So there was one just incredible sighting that I had in Bandipur. But like I said, it's, it was one park that really drew me, drew my love for, for big cats, especially coming across these amazing tigers, amazing leopards. And that's when I got to also meet a lot of friendly people like Mohan, like, uh, you know, Giri and, and uh, Giant and Sachin and all these places, all these guys who are, are the who's who of wildlife photography right now. I got to meet them during these beautiful days that I spent out. Uh, in the beautiful parks of yeah. Bandipur. Philip, uh, what is the best time to visit Bandipur? Best months, I would, I would say. Park is anytime best time, but what's the best <laughs> Yeah, well, well, it all depends on uh, if you want to have a better chance of sightings or a better chance of making better images. Hmm. So, so that's a big question that I have for South India because so, the beauty about South India is we, we're open right through the year, right? right? In the summer months as well as the, uh, the, the monsoon months. Now, for me personally, to have a sighting, it would have to be the driest season. So from the month of January end onwards, the forests of South India started to dry up quite rapidly. So you have Feb, March, April being your peak months for very, very good sightings. And going up to the pre-monsoon showers of May. So that entire period is very, very good for sightings. But I find that photography, photographically, unless it's a nice, open, clean, blurred out background kind of thing, it's very, very distracting seeing a brownish, goldenish animal against a very brownish, goldenish background. Hmm. So my favorite time to visit any South Indian park would be just after the rains in October and November. Because that's when the, the forests are lush and green. Also, the cool thing is the forest department would have just about cleared the view lines, giving you that really, really magnificent setup for good photographs. So my personal favorite, even though sightings are much lesser, it's a more chance of coming across an animal. I would definitely go around October, November, December, parts of December when it's still lush and green to give you those fantastic photo ops for sure. Right. So moving on to the neighboring park, Mudumalai, where you guys have done a fantastic documentary. I remember looking at it and I said, firstly, I want to firstly go and stay in that upper Kargudi guest house. <laughs> Number two, what an amazing sighting of the black leopard is, along with those amazing other leopards and tigers that you'll have in just seven or eight days you'll spend there, right? Only seven days. Which is just crazy. Also, almost everything that Mudumalai, and that's the potential of Mudumalai. I think it's one of those parks that if really managed well and, you know, a new tourism plan comes into place where you could go out and explore, just like how Karnataka is doing, it would be one of those top-notch wildlife destinations that anyone could go to. I'm sure you guys would agree as well. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. So I, I got to meet a very close friend in, in, on my travels to Bandipur who had this fantastic property out in Mudumalai. And that started my journey into the world of camera trapping. So apart from doing a little bit of basic camera trapping in the farm, 
I used to go out to my friend's property in Mudumalai to set up these camera traps. And what I loved about Mudumalai was the entire landscape. It was a lot more, uh, you know, the, there was more hills around the area because of the Nilgiris. You had these amazing waterfalls with the Kalati Falls and this beautiful elephant coming out there. But just the, the sheer diversity of range of forests you would get there. So if you go to this area called Chital Walks, which is run by a place called Mark Davider, uh, there was a beautiful little guest house that he had that you would just sit on his property in his veranda and you would watch wildlife come into those view lines. And one evening, I, was, I, was, I happened to be uh, out there with a very close friend of mine, Samir Jain, and of course, Don, Don Anderson was there as well, when we had this fantastic, fantastic sighting of a tiger, elephants, and a little peacock in the same opportunity, in the same frame. Now, this was something that was so unbelievable to see. You had to put your camera down and actually look at it and pinch yourself to see that it was not a dream. Um, this, this sighting was while we were having lunch, by the way. We had gone there to spend the whole day with Mark. Uh, so we were close friends with Mark. And, um, and Don was there as well. So I got, to, uh, I got to meet Mark through Don as well. So he was there spending a the day, spending the, uh, couple of days with him. So I, I was staying in Sami Jain's place, a beautiful property called Forest Hills. And we drove up to his place for lunch. And while we were having lunch, uh, we, we saw this peacock was uh, at this point. At, uh, I mean, we, start, we saw it first. And was walking along the top of this ridge and stuff and going down. And then all of a sudden, the peacock gives an alarm call. Now, normally, you don't really take a peacock's alarm call too seriously, right? It could be for any predator of that the peacock thinks it's going gonna, it's gonna to try and kill it. So initially, we were still enjoying our lunch, etc. When suddenly, um, I remember, I think, I think it was Mark itself. It says, tiger, tiger. So out from the side, walking from here, from this exact spot where these Opentia... Uh, cactus are, these, uh, this tiger walks out like this, comes right onto the view line and plonks itself down and lies down and goes to sleep. And we were like, what? So we, dropped, we, le we left our lunch, uh, grabbed the cameras once again and started to, to shoot these pictures. Now, this is a picture taken at about maybe three, 200 mm, a little over 200 mm. I didn't want to zoom in further because I liked the fact that this canopy of these trees sort of formed a nice vignette for composition. It created a nice frame for the, for the image as well. And about, about an hour later, an hour later, suddenly the branches start breaking in the background and uh, out pops these elephants. And then you could see um, this amazing sort of coexistence between tigers and elephants and, and how if, you know, the tiger, if the elephants don't sense the tigers in, uh, in a stalking mode or not a threat to it, they just live peacefully with each other. They're like, even though they could be the worst of enemies, they could also be the best of friends at certain points of time. So this was one incredible, incredible sighting that I had um, in, in Mudumalai, which I think very, very few people get to witness uh, things like that, especially in Mudumalai. And uh, I, I know there was an amazing uh, sighting that brought, brought back this image memory was recently in Kabini when there was this male tiger that tried to attack a young uh, elephant, right? Mm -hmm. And the, the, the video went viral recently. So that was uh, incredible as well. But uh, seeing them being so peaceful with each other was just amazing. And while we were watching this, another elephant comes right in front of the frame and blocks this view. So we were like, oh man, go away, go away. We want to see the tiger. But the tiger eventually did leave. It got up and went and drank water and then went away. So that was one super sighting that I had in Mudumalai. But coming back to my friend's property, right? So this guy's got, he he's got heaven on earth, basically. He's got this incredible, incredible, massive uh, estate. And uh, half of the estate is cultivated, half the, half the estate is left wild. And uh, there's no boundary because, uh, you know, there was this big uh, elephant corridor case that's happening in the region. So they asked them to remove all sorts of fences. There's no uh, fence at all to be, to be kept in that area. And um, because of that, there were a lot of wildlife started coming into the property itself. And that's when I started setting up these camera traps. I would set up these basic Bushnell camera traps on various of these roads. And we did this for quite some time, for about two years. And in the two years, we documented uh, Mohan and Amit, I think, everything out there. Wow. Everything out there. Like, we, we, we documented four different individual tigers, mm -hmm. including cubs. Uh, we documented six leopards. Um, we documented wild dogs. We documented porcupines, brown palm civets. Um, lots of, uh, we documented a pangolin, leopard cat. It was just incredible amount of documentation that happened right on a private property. But we never ever thought in our wildest dreams that there was a black leopard there. So we were 
on a family trip. So I, I used to go there with my friend and him and our friends together as well on these, on these trips. But on one trip, my mom and dad wanted to go along. So I took them because I told you every molecule of them breathes my life as well. So they, they love, in fact, whenever I go on my jaunts to Kabini and all that, and the day in Bangalore, they're always jealous <laughs> of me being in the park. So I had taken them along, along with my brother and another friend of my dad. So we'd gone in, in his, uh, his car, it's in my, in my dad's car as well, itself. And we started to drive around the estate uh, at about five o'clock in the evening. Now there are multiple, but five or six roads out there on the estate, okay? Uh, there were five or six roads on the estate. And um, we had chosen to drive on this road that we used to call the Samba Road, okay? Mm -hmm. Which is similar to how you have it in Kobe, <laughs> right? This, this Samba Road. So we're driving on this Samba Road and it was on um, through a place where there's a little nursery where there's young coffee plants being, being grown over there. And we had just gone past it when I heard a Samba alarm call. Samba road, Samba alarm call, right? And uh, the Samba alarm call was coming from a road higher than where we were. It was called the Viewpoint Road, which is uh, about maybe three, 400 meters to the left of us on a higher road. So we, what, if, we ha if we wanted to go to Viewpoint Road, we would take a U-turn, come back to the house, then climb up a back road and then go on to Viewpoint Road. So I told my dad to stop the car. And I told him, listen, now uh, we have a high chance of seeing something on Viewpoint Road. Let's go back and then come back on Samba Road and do the other roads after that. So this was just meant to be, I think, because at the exact spot that we stopped to listen to the call, my dad decided to take a turn there itself. So he's parked on the road and he turns the car to the right, okay, to take a, to, to take a turn, basically take a U-turn mm. and believe it or not, from that very bush that he turns the right into, out runs out the Black Panther. <laughs> it, was, wow. it was just meant to be. It was, just, it was not at all a place that we, we went to listen to that. That Sama call was for some other cat. Mm. It was for some other cat completely. And out runs this, this, this panther running out, stopping, turning, and looking back at us. And it was, I don't know, maybe even the first people that they saw and we were the first people, we were the uh, first to see this big cat. So it was very, very inquisitive for almost maybe six or seven minutes. It just kept stopping, looking, would stare back, kept looking back and saying, and then it finally went into the, into the forest. So it was just absolutely stunning. And, and, and to just, like I told you, to, to be in a place where you're stopping for some other call and turning the car and for that animal to run out was just fate, I think. Because if it, we didn't hear the call, I'm sure we would have driven past. And till today, we probably wouldn't have known that a black leopard lived there. Because even after that, even after three years of camera trapping, after that, we never got this on camera trap. Mm. Just like a ghost, because we documented everything except this female. And uh, so we did the whole circuit after that. We tried, we saw it, we, was, we, we came back, we called half of Bangalore. We told them that, uh, we told them that we saw the most incredible side. My friend who owns the property was literally in tears because he, was, he had missed it, but also he was so joyous because of, uh, of a sighting like this. And this is a time when there was no one who had black leopard images, right? It was at a time when uh, Prakash set the, set, the, uh, set the bar with his amazing sighting that he had in Kotagiri. And then I think this was it. And then after that, I think Mohan, uh, uh, Praveen and Thomas and all saw that, that their Dandeli one. Yeah. It was the next, next image after that. that, that oh. Exactly. So you can see how uh, things where it was so rare at that point in time. So this was some incredible, incredible luck that I would say. And Philip, Philip I, would want, uh, I want to ask you something. Yeah. When you just first saw this yeah. uh, blackie in front of you, yeah. did you believe that you are seeing a blackie? <laughs> <laughs> even, even now you look, I've got goosebumps. In fact, I'll tell you how crazy the sighting was. So my brother on the right of the car spotted it. Okay, He said, Oh my God, Black Panther, Black Panther. And immediately we were like, whoa. And, and because the car was now facing the Black Panther, we were, I was in the right position. Because I was right next to my dad and in the drive, next to the driver in the passenger seat. So I just popped my head out to the side and look. Now, because I was doing that, my, my poor mom in the, at the back of me couldn't see this thing clearly. But the excitement was so much in the, in the air that after I shot the Black Leopard and, and looked back to give everyone a high five, my mom's not there. She's on top of the car. She actually climbed through the, through the, through the window of the Fortuner and she's sitting on top of the car and looking at the, and she was like in awe, mm -hmm. absolutely in awe. Because, and this was the amount of excitement that cut through it. So it did not hit us at all initially that 
we saw something as rare as this, but two, three minutes later, we were jumping for joy. We were just, it was just the most thrilling thing that I've ever seen. And, and firstly, when you see a black leopard that's not in a tourism zone, for your eyes only, so to speak, the, 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 the pleasure is just another level. <laughs> the, 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 I'm sure even when you guys saw your black leopard, <laughs> well, from Dandeli, well, hmm. when this black panther came right on the middle of the road and is looking at me, yeah. it, believe me, it took me one whole minute to believe that it is a black <laughs> panther that I am seeing. Yeah. I, I could believe that it's a black <laughs> panther. See, yeah, yeah. now black panther has become very common nowadays. Yeah. But those days seeing a black panther, it is uh, oh, yeah. amazing. Amazing it's, experience. But Philip, uh, black panther sighting even today uh, makes someone uh, a good singer. Because uh, in our uh, trip in Mudumalai, when we had the Black Panther, after the sighting, the shoot is over, right from that place to uh, the hotel, and then till the next day, till the time we came back to Bangalore, Mohan Sir was singing only one song. Probably at <laughs> some other point, I'll tell you that song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's one crazy, crazy. And I think this is what keeps us as wildlife photographers afloat and alive. Hmm. The, the fact that every day in the park is different, it cannot be repeated is what just drives us to keep going on and on and on and on. Why are we all spending so much money traveling to different parts of the, of the country and the world, etc., to see these beautiful animals? It's just the amount of joy it gives us. It turns us into kids in candy stores, I think. True. Like, uh, it just makes us want to go again and again. These are kind of once-in-a-lifetime, once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like... This particular sighting of the black leopard for me would, would, would rate as one of the greatest wildlife sightings for me because like I told you, the rarity at that point in time, um, the, the fact that we were the only vehicle, the fact that it was in a private estate, all those factors playing a part of this particular part of the sighting really drove it to another level of a sighting. So, um, and, it's, and another thing was also you share that sighting with your family uh, that as he loves wildlife. So that was another real cool driving factor for me. Uh, being one of the best uh, sightings out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it was just terrible. But like like Mohan said, um, nowadays uh, with Kabini Panther, of course he's an amazing animal, and of course the uh, people born at this part of this time of their lives, are, 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 among with all of us, are sure privileged to see this animal. Because imagine in the history of the world, in the history of the world, this is no one had black leopard sightings like how it is right now mm. in the history of the world. So we're all really blessed to have really, really cool sightings of this. So moving on from Mudumalai, of course, Nagarhole um, and Kabini, uh, which is a part of Nagarhole, is now the new wildlife hotspot, thanks to the amazing sightings that it has. But before I started going really and going too much to Kabini, I used to travel to um, the Kutta side, the Kurg side of Nagarhole. Mm -hmm. I used to love that main road. I don't know uh, if you guys have, you've done it, Amit, but I know, I think- yeah, yeah. I've, I've, I've done it. I've done it. Yeah. So that from that road from Bira Hosana Halli all the way to Nanachi Gate, and you can do the Karmadu Road on one side, or you can do Metikupe Road on one side. That was just one of the best main roads one could go on. I think along with the BR Hills, Kegudi to BR Hills Road, or from Gumbali Gate uh, right up to the other gate, um, along with this road, I think is one of the best forest drives you can go on uh, anywhere uh, that's allowed in, in India right now in terms of your driving in your own vehicle. So I used to do a lot of drives over there uh, with my dad, with my friends, etc. And there was one place that I always wanted to have a sighting, which is a place called Chitte Bande, mm -hmm. near Murkal. Okay, there's a place called Murkal Elephant Camp. And just after that, as you're driving towards, uh, uh, towards the Nagarole reception, you'll see one big rock on the right-hand side of the road. Even now, you'll go and see this big rock. And the forest guards and all the locals call it Chitte Bande, which means leopard rock. So I've driven on that road maybe hundreds, hundred, hundred fifty times before I had this absolutely stellar sighting of this leopard on the rock there. Wow. So he was right on the side of the road uh, and along with close friends of mine and my dad once again. So there was a, a very famous um, naturalist in Kegudi called Mandana. Um, uh, he now does his own filming, etc. So he shared this moment with me along with a, another nice guy, another friend of mine called Thomas Anand, uh, who was very, very... Uh, regular and going out to trips. Now I think he's a workaholic and loves to spend time on his computer and home. But uh, earlier, uh, he used to do some trips with me and we were blessed with this stunning sighting 
First, the leopard crossed the road. It didn't, wasn't, on the, wasn't on the rock. It crossed the road in front of us and it went into the grass. It waited there for some time. And then uh, a little later, um, we, we lost sight out of it because it was quite tall grass. And two minutes later, on the rock it was. And then it was smelling the rock. It got into this really cool posture. All the time keeping his eyes on us. And we were very close to it. So even with the 100, 400, you managed to get some really, really cool uh, shots of this leopard on the rock. So this was my first feature as well on the cover of a magazine. So back in 2009, INW days, uh, Shah Abdul uh, was counting the INW page for all the content he could use for all his, uh, for his book and stuff. And this image was uh, luckily chosen as the um, uh, February issue cover image at that point in time. So it was a big uh, thing for me at that point in time. Sanctuary magazine, right? Yeah, Sanctuary, Sanctuary Asia magazine, yeah. But, but that road, particularly that Nagarole road was amazing. I've had some stunning sightings. In fact, there's one crazy habituated bear over there that mm -hmm. walks on this road uh, all the time and doesn't really bother. Very unlikely uh, uh, behavior of most sloth bears that you see uh, usually in the wild. But another cool sighting I had on that same road was this Nagarole king. So they call him the Nagarole king. He, he's near the Nagarole reception area. And um, um, he's just a massive hunk of an animal. Um, he's really, really bold. I think because he sees so many vehicles on that, on that main road going up and down, uh, he really doesn't bother. And once he comes onto the road, so we saw him on the side of the road early in the morning and he walks out in the middle of the road and he covers the entire road. Basically, it was that, that big uh, to see this guy. I think even Praveen Sidanwar has got a very beautiful image. Uh, Karthik Rugvedi has got a very beautiful image of this same individual. But, he's, but not many other people, I think, have got uh, a picture of this particular big male tiger. Very typical to see uh, a Nagarole tiger with these dark eyes and, and uh, things like that you normally see compared to, say, a Bandhagar tiger or whatever. So this is very cool to see uh, out in Nagarole. But coming to the most famous part of Nagarole, where I frequent now almost twice a month, uh, would have to be Kabini. Um, Kabini, I think for all of us living in Bangalore is a blessing because you could just go and spend a weekend and have a very, very productive trip. I know now in Bandipur, you have to be really lucky to have a very photographically productive trip. You can have a very good relaxation trip. You can have great food. You can have all that. But to come back with those postable, really, really high quality images, Bandipur needs a bit of work to do. Like you need to really work at your sightings, you need to have a really good luck setup. But Kabini, on the other hand, somehow now with the amount of tigresses in the area, etc., with Sabadal Cubs, has just become a beautiful uh, place to go out and spend a couple of days and come back with some good sightings. Now, when I started visiting Kabini, it was back in 2002. At that point in time, no one went for big cats out there. Everyone just went there for the elephant congregation. Mm -hmm. At that point in time, uh, Colonel John Wakefield uh, Papa Wakefield was the brand ambassador as well as the manager, the resident manager of GLR. And uh, he used to um, take drives. He used to drive people out as well, even at that point in time. And I remember going on safaris with him where we would go out looking for elephants. And, and at that point in time, Kabani maybe had one leopard sighting every 20 days, every 30 days. It was, it was quite poor. But once again, thanks to protection, thanks to just controlling the amount of human activity in the park and thanks to more anti-poaching camps and more uh, patrolling, etc., nature just bounces back. And what I saw in Banagata right now with this tiger coming back, likewise, Kabini in the month, in the years of 2005 onwards, suddenly popped up to be the leopard capital of the Indian subcontinent for sure. I think only Yala in Sri Lanka could compete with Kabini in terms of sightings. But if you want to see a leopard on a tree, you would have to go to Kabini. At that point in time, 2007, 8, 9, I remember coming back from trips where me and Giri would do a trip and 14 leopards, 15 leopards that trip. It was just so mad for leopards. Almost every place you would go, you would uh, come across leopard families or dominant leopards like Scarface and Tonias and um, uh, this beautiful female called Cleo and just some fantastic leopards that we would get to see around the Kabini area. So some of my favorite places to go out and photograph a leopard on a tree was definitely Kabini. So this particular male that uh, we christened Scarface was one really big, bold male. And he used to rule the backwaters. Almost every time you would hear alarm calls in some area, you'd know it's Scarface only. And he was, he was quite bold. So there's one particular evening uh, when I was driving uh, with, a, with a group that I had when I was working with Toehold. 
uh, we were really lucky to come across first the female sitting just behind the bushes. And then, of course, Scarface didn't bother about us. He walks around and sits on top of this termite hill. And he started making this weird formation with his face. He was not, he was not making any sound, really. He was just like pulling his jaws back. It's something similar to a Fleming response, but it wasn't Fleming, where he was like making maybe such a low de- uh, like intensity call that he was drawing this leopard towards him. And all of a sudden, magic happened. Just like how Mohan had that crazy uh, leopard mating sighting uh, with the temple male, Scarface did the same thing for me and started mating with uh, this female um, right in front of us in the open. It was just incredible to see. And you could see that she was in pain, but he was also trying to force his uh, sort of manhood on him and on her and stuff. And uh, they, they, they just went at it for about maybe four or five seconds, that's it, before she slapped him and it, the show was over. But this moment to see in front of us, I think was one of those first images of leopards mating on the ground. I remember company had a few pictures that they had leopard mating on a tree, but on the ground, I think this is one of the first images. And uh, I'm proud to say that this particular image was uh, uh, submitted for the 17th biennial FIAP World Cup that was held in India itself, in Bangalore. And um, apart from being a part of the team uh, that won the gold medal, this particular image won an individual medal as well, which was uh, quite a proud moment for me. So that was, that was awesome. Uh, but yeah, um, seeing leopard mating is, is, seeing any animal mating is an amazing, like it's quite a tense sort of moment. But uh, I think uh, this particular moment, seeing that lovely green background, having it out on a termite hill at eye level, what more could you ask for, right? <laughs> it was just, it was just, it was just heaven. Uh, I heaven. think this won the sanctuary Asia also. Uh, no, no, no. It, it was a special mention, but it didn't win uh, the sanctuary Asia. Um, and of, of course, when, when leopards mate, you know that in a few months' time, something's going to happen. You're going to get cubs in the area. And of course, two, uh, a year after that, we got to see the same female with her sub-adult cub from wow. that previous mating on a tree. So wow. this is how, this is the beauty about traveling to a certain place every, every so often. You get to actually track the wildlife in that area. You can keep a family tree, so to speak, of what's happening uh, in, in the park at that point of time. So... Of course, this, this crazy sighting that I had once again was uh, amazing to see both of them sitting high up on the tree, uh, looking back at us. There was a kill on the same tree, so that's why they were there for so, for so long and together. But to see them sitting together in that nice posture uh, made the moment for me, which was really, really good. Um, if you go into the other side of the park, of course, the most dominant male would have to be the temple male or what, common, what we commonly call Tonia. So Tonia is this beautiful uh, male leopard that I love to see because he's another, he, he's like a tiger really, man. He doesn't care about vehicles. He, he just walks like head on, uh, close. He just, you know, if, if, if there's a three or four vehicles that also, he just stays as calm as possible. So he's a really, really beautiful uh, leopard. I've heard that he hasn't been seen since the lockdown. Yeah. And um, there are rumors that he, he he's either passed on after a wonderful uh, age and and spending a lot a good year amount of time in Kabini, or he's been found a girlfriend somewhere else and moved to <laughs> a different part of the park. We don't know, but uh, I hope I hope the latter is true, and I hope he's still alive. But um, even if he's gone, he was a real beautiful animal to see. And I think all of us who visited Kabini frequently have definitely laid eyes on him. He's just an incredible, beautiful, incredibly beautiful uh, uh, leopard to see. But. Of course, uh, on, on, on some days when you get to see him, he is on a road called the Old MM Road, where you will see him walking towards you um, on, on a tar road and stuff to that, which is, which is incredible to see. And I was there just last week, and um, even though I went to the area looking for him, uh, I was in the other end of the park uh, near the Barbale stream, and I got to see this wonderful sighting after a long time to see a leopard on a tree in Kabini. This was just last week, guys. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, sighting a leopard now in Kabini has really done role reversal of what it was before. I remember, like I told you, 14 leopards a trip, etc. Now you would come back with insane amount of tiger sightings, but uh, leopards, on the other hand, uh, are much more uh, less. I think maybe because the tiger sightings have gone up more. The balance shift? uh, The balance shift, yeah. The balance shift basically has happened in the area. But to see a leopard like this on a tree after a long time was a good feeling for me. In fact, I was like really, really happy to see this um, uh, after many, many years of seeing a beautiful leopard on a tree. But we haven't spoken about one animal in Kabini that, like I told you, like Mohan brought him up a little earlier, but who is drawing 
more and more people to come to Kabini every day and trying to get a sight of would have to be the Black Leopard of Kabini. Now, I know he probably isn't as special as Mohan's Dan Daily Leopard or my Mudumalai Leopard or even uh, Prakash's Kotegiri Leopard, Black Leopard, but he is a beautiful animal. We have to, we can't deny it. He is one creature that is really revolutionized the world of both filmmaking and of course, uh, the world of people wanting to photograph a black leopard in their lifetime. And for all of you guys who haven't seen him as yet, do travel more to Kabini because you don't never know if he goes, when we're going to see another black leopard as habituated as him may not be in our lifetime at all. So you have to try and see how you can get to see him. But one evening I was, uh, so I was on a trip, a four night trip and uh, it was two years ago and uh, we had spotted him with a kill on a tree just beyond the, the view line. Okay, so he was not in the best position as on a tree. He was like slightly behind and he was feeding on this spotted deer that was just a few little, little bit of remains out there. At that point of time, um, there was a film filming crew from Symbio Studios who was making a film on the Black Leopard who used to spend the entire day with him. So I was staying uh, with uh, the bison at that point of time on a kid's camp. Um, that I was running a, a group of kids for. And I was keeping in touch with the filmmaker the whole day because he was with the panther. And he was telling me that this panther just sitting on the tree the whole time. Now, he were like, if he's eating so much and his belly is quite full, he has to come and drink water some, sometime. He needs to come and drink water. And it didn't happen the entire day that they saw on the first day. We don't, don't know what happened at night. Maybe he came down the tree and drank water. I think he probably did, but... During the time that the filmmaker's there, from 6.30 in the morning till 6 in the evening, he did not drink water. He was just sitting in that same position. And he was panting and all that. So, on the third day, I, was, I made a call once again in the afternoon at about 1.30 uh, to John and Shaz and I asked them, have you come to drink water? They said, no. So I said, okay, guys, when we go there, we have a good chance of him coming to drink water because of the fact that he's not drunk for three days. At least we don't have evidence of him drinking water for three days. And right enough, we went over there. He's still sitting in the same position and he's panting away to glory. He is like, he's, he's really, really panting away to glory. So I told my group, I said, guys, we have a golden opportunity. I think if we spend time out here, I know it's not photography friendly right now. He's in the clutter. You're seeing just a bit of his tail, a bit of his belly, parts of his face, but it's not great photographically. But if we position our vehicle right now and spend some time and wait for him, hopefully he does decide to show himself. So yeah, so I, we were waiting at that spot and I told my guests, you know, we just have to wait it out because we could either hit and strike gold or we could go back with just the, the sighting of him. So luckily I had a group of guys who were quite regular to company and they were willing to wait it out and leave all the other amazing sites that company has to offer. So we waited, waited, waited. And towards the end of the safari, finally, our stars align um, and we strike gold and out comes him from below the tree into the, towards the water and he drinks right in front of us. So this was just something else. <laughs> to see him come and with his beautiful yellow eyes, that dark coat, sit down and, and like I told you, it was pure positioning because we knew that if he came and drank, we were slightly behind or slightly forward, we would never get this sort of angle that we would have dreamt for. It was purely our, our hard work and patience uh, that really played a part of giving us this amazing sighting and the fact that um, the Black Panther obliged to it as well. And he came down and he drank, I, I'm telling you guys, at least 15 minutes, he just kept drinking water. Like I think he made up for the three days of not drinking. He just kept on and on and on. He took a break. He looked around again, go back to drinking. I've never seen a cat drink so much of water. Just, I think half, so this is not a water hole really. It's a little salt lick that is filled up with water because of the pre-monsoon rains. So it's filled up with a little bit of water, but I think he drank half that water in the salt lick itself because the next time I went there, it was dry. <laughs> but it was just something else to see uh, this beautiful uh, animal. But like I told you, even though I'm a big, big fan of the leopards of Kabini, one tigress in Kabini that really lures me again and again to go and see her is the queen of Kabini right now. The backwater female uh, of, of Kabini. Now this tigress, I remember in 2014, I got to see her the first time. Mm -hmm. She was about a little over two months old. So she was with her mother on the backwaters. With a, I was driving with the most amazing driver that unfortunately we lost him this year. 
uh, Chotu, he was so incredible with me and we gelled a lot together. Uh, we were, we were, you know, very similar with our mindset, etc. So it was amazing to work with him. And we, we had this fantastic sighting with her. And after that, we kept seeing her again and again till she fostered her mother's uh, litter when she passed away, when her mother passed away. And then she started raising her own cubs. So it was one, one morning on a, on a, I think, February morning when we got to see her. And she, we knew the cubs were in the area. And I had this incredible sighting where all three cubs popped up behind the mother to look uh, when the mother turned back. It was just this amazing sighting that we had of her. And almost every month I get to see her and I've grown uh, to have this fantastic sort of connection with her over the many years. Because I, like I told her, I've seen her when she was about this age. And now she's, of course, raising her second litter of three cubs, which are incredible as well. And um, one particular sighting I had, guys, which I have to tell you, was on a kids' camp again that I was doing. So we, would, we, had, we, had, we, had, we had the Z, B zone permit, and uh, we had entered the park. We had driven on a road called the Kumla Gali Road. And uh, the strategy over there in companies was you, you communicate with the drivers who you know are in the same zone, and you sort of strategize. You say, okay, you go do Sigu Road. You go, you go do Masti Gudi Road. I'll do Kumla Gali Road. You do Old Mem Road. So that way, you know, you kind of work together to try and get an on a sighting. So we had driven down on the Kumla Gali Road. And all of a sudden, one of the kids in the back, and that's amazing about these kids as well. They're so keen about sighting wildlife. Um, See, stop, 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 stop. There's a tiger there. There's a tiger there. So we said, yeah, wow, stop. So we stopped. And right enough, in this little ditch at the Kumla Gali Water, she was sitting over there. And over there, you don't have any phone network. So unfortunately, we couldn't even tell any of the other people that there was a tiger sighting. But this tiger was, this beautiful backwater female was lying down in the damp mud. And she was just playing around, flicking her tail, turning around, typical of how uh, a big cat is, you know, when you spend time with them. And we were spending about 15 minutes with her when all of a sudden, we heard this leopard sawing. Now this leopard was sawing what I thought was on the Sigu road and um, immediately you could hear that sawing, that typical, <laughs> <laughs> that deep sound. And it immediately woke up this tiger. This tiger went from completely cool, lying down, playing around with herself, etc. Suddenly both ears open and popped up, looked around, got up and started trotting towards that sound. Like actually started running towards where the sound came from. And all of a sudden it came back out once again. And we were like, Okay, she's obviously she lost interest in the sound, whatever. And then once again, this leopard starts to saw again. Immediately, she takes off once again. Now, at that point of time, Chotu uh, said that uh, we'll wait here only because she's going and coming back. She may come back again. But I, will, I had a very, because you know how leopards, uh, when they call, or any animal calls in the forest, the sound really travels a lot. You think it's pretty close, but the way those, uh, the vibrations echo through the air, it's really, really close. And I've had the pleasure of hearing Tigers roar and uh, leopards call from my friend's estate, right? I told you about in Mudumalai. We almost every night, including, um, you know, wake up in the morning to alarm calls and you hear these amazing calls of the animal. So I, 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 I know that sometimes when you hear a, a leopard sawing, it may sound close, but it's quite fast. So I told Choto, listen, let's just drive up towards the jackal point, do Sigu Road and quickly come back here if there's no animal. And we did that. We, we drove up, went to Four Cross Junction, took a ride going back up Sigu Road. And we saw a filmmaking car with Mandana in it. He was working for Wild Karnataka at that point of time. So Wild Karnataka was being filmed at that point of time. And his car was parked off the road. I knew the, with the way the camera was pointing, he's looking at something. We went up there and Scarface is on the tree. Now, Scarface sitting up on the tree had no clue that the backwater female was coming after him. But we knew that because, and Mandana, who was sitting in the car, didn't know that we were looking at the tiger all this time. So he asked me what I was seeing. I said that we were looking at the tiger. Now it's coming up towards this direction. So we were like, oh man, this is with bated breath. We're waiting over here. And Scarface again, once again, gives out this crazy call. And you should see what, when a leopard calls, it's not just their mouth moving. It's their, from their, you know, from their belly upwards, they, they, they sort of gain that energy to, to make their call really resonate through the forest. So he was like lifting up his belly and going, <laughs> it was just incredible to see. And right enough, just about maybe 200 meters behind his tree, out pops the backwater female. Now she doesn't know exactly which tree he's on. And she sees two vehicles already parked here, my vehicle and the filmmaker's vehicle. And she comes out, comes out onto the road. Now we as photographers, do you know what to photograph? <laughs> Should we photograph 
scarf is on the tree or should we move back to photographing the 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 backwater female on the road and this tiger is like looking around quite inquisitively and actually comes towards our vehicle walks around it and then carries on down the road no it doesn't it completely misses so so basically we we look behind us on this is happening on the right of us okay so the leopard is on the tree on the right of us the tiger walks out from behind the leopard comes on to the road comes on to the left of us now crosses from the left of us and then starts walking down the road on on the same road we were we were facing and we said what a girl daft female this is she can't smell this leopard on the tree and she's totally missed out and she doesn't even know that we are looking at it okay she's just walking down the road and this leopard also doesn't know the tiger was there all this time because he was looking away so he calls once again and immediately on that fourth or fifth call this tiger turns back and looks on the road fantastic photo op because now we get this tiger beautiful backlight and um the tiger on the road we got this fantastic picture of her on the road turning and looking back into the direction and now starts running okay starts trotting towards the direction comes right past our vehicle and takes one glance to the right and finally sees him so you can see over here she's at the bottom here and here is he sitting on top of the tree and this is when he gets to see her as well because all this time he didn't know she was there and she knew he was in the area but didn't know didn't know didn't pinpoint him at all so we were like man this is incredible so i was i usually shoot now, now I've, from my 100 phone i progressed to buying a 500 mm f4 and i have an assortment of other lenses as well so i shifted from the 500 mm down to the 24 105 and we're shooting this with the wide angle to get both of them in perspective and she looked she looked at the leopard on the tree and turned away for some reason she didn't she knew that the distance probably from her to the tree was still a bit far because then he would he would run up and scoot so she turned away and walked away and walked into the bushes which was so unbelievable to see this behavior she she walked away and into the bushes and we're like what is happening she definitely saw him because in the picture you can see her turn around she stopped and maybe glanced for about maybe 2 or 3 seconds before she carried on but why did she do that but this was her this was her reason guys she has gone through this lantana and come out from right below the tree and in the meantime this leopard as well scarface got wary of her so he's started becoming precautionary precautionary he got up went down to this junction jumped up on this other uh, bark and climbed up little higher and kept looking down kept looking down suddenly she comes out jumps on the tree and runs up all the way to here to this very very spot and he's he's making and he's like he's like jumping up and down on on the uh, much much lighter branches and snarling while she's like growling but the way this moment was was just one of those absolutely stellar sightings i think to me after that black panther i had in mudumla this was one of those sightings right up there in the in the parts of south india to see a uh, firstly a tiger and leopard in the same frame is once in a lifetime but to see this tiger use tactics to try and see how he can she can defeat this guy was was something else and um, he went really high up the tree on very very thin branches so she even because of her weight and plus she not used to climbing on those kind of branches she she came back down and you know what she did she started lying down on the bottom of the tree she actually lay down on the bottom of the tree and she fell asleep and this poor fellow was right on top then it became 6 o'clock we had to leave so we left the filmmakers were there for about 15 minutes they also had to leave and uh, we assume that she finally got fed up and she went and this guy came down after that during the wee part of the morning so it was it was some incredible moment that i got to see in kabi and uh, this two pair are born uh, enemies i think yes absolutely absolutely there was another video uh, did you see that which this tiger one? just climbs a uh, vertical tree behind the remember that that was in bison oh yeah yeah of course of course that was there was actually a few weeks before this yes it was a few weeks before this this sight this sighting yeah 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 exactly a vertical tree which is incredible right she was really after this scarface but luckily they still they still coexist they scarface is still happily in the bison he was seen just a few weeks ago and of course uh, this this backwater female uh, is uh, very much this, this part of the forest is very much a home still with her cubs So it's amazing that even though they're the worst of enemies, they still live in the same area. <laughs> they're like they're like Tom and Jerry. Tom and Jerry, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
<laughs> so yeah, so so my affinity were towards these big cats in Kabini just grows stronger and stronger every time I go there. And uh, um, I now lead photography tours out to Kabini um, every every month. And um, it's, it's just amazing that I, I'm privileged to go there and uh, try and sort of take note of all my observations that I'm going to have for the next uh, few, few, few years or whatever I live. So I can really document this entire family tree of this beautiful backwater field. Yeah. And guys, uh, for all those workshops for Philip, uh, I'm going to send all those links in the description. So you can join him for his trip. He's, he's not only a photographer, but amazing storyteller and a fantastic naturalist. You know, uh, his, his knowledge in this uh, Nilgiri biosphere is, is simply unmatched. So please do join him on his uh, upcoming tours. I'm going to send uh, all the links in the description, guys. And the USP of Philip, I'll tell you, he is specialized in training yeah. young kids. Yeah. I have uh, talked to a couple of, uh, even today, one participant who went with Philip, they just are very happy. They, they, he, he loves to uh, train young boys and girls about wildlife and nature. That is his... Uh, star attraction of Philip. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys. Yeah, thanks a lot. But coming back to my travels, so obviously, Bandipur, Kabini are two hot spots that everyone can travel to. But you know what I really, really like is also visiting these lesser known areas. Mm -hmm. So I'm a big fan of getting a forest bungalow, access to a forest bungalow somewhere in a lesser known area of the, of, of the country, of lesser known areas of the Western Ghats, etc. This is what you know, it's, it's something that you feel privileged to go to when you know that there's not other, there's no, not, not too many other people out there. And you know, it, it just gives me that, that special privilege. So that's why I like going to my friend's farm. I like going to my property and I like to spend and do a lot of photography there. So I work with um, a, a sort of NGO that helps save a very, very cool fish called the Marcia. Hmm. This NGO is called the Wildlife Association of South India. Now the Marcia is a flagship species of fish that's found in the Kaveri Basin. So all major rivers in the Kaveri Basin, like the Kaveri River, the Moya River, the uh, Bhavani River, and uh, you know, different uh, rivers that feed the Kaveri have this particular fish. So we, we go out and do a lot of surveys. And because of that, I get to travel to some amazing hotspots. One of these really cool hotspots is a place called Upper Bhavani. Now Upper Bhavani is higher reaches of the Nilgiris. It's, um, it's just, fascinating. It's, it's a different world out there. It's landscape like you've never seen. It's shola grasslands with the most amazing shola forest with these amazing emerald colored water dams, etc. out there. And it is amazing. So I got to go there not to do uh, masia research because you don't get masia up in the cold out there, but I you do some research on trout, which were released by the British mm -hmm. long, long time ago. And in the process of going out there, you get to see a lot of cool wildlife. That's another cool uh, thing about being a, a researcher is that you get access to these special places. But at the same time, if you're interested in photography, you're interested in wildlife, it's a brilliant thing because you're not going for that particular species, but you're seeing so many other things. So in January this year, um, 2020, uh, just before we knew this stupid COVID is going to start hitting, uh, I got to travel to Upper Bhavani and it's up and beautiful out there. And, um, you know, what's special about that landscape, like I told you, is not only the, the looks totally different from, say, a Kabini or a Bandipur, but also you get some special plants, you get some special, um, you know, type of habitat that you don't see anywhere else. Like there's a particular flower there called the rhododendron. Mm. Uh, it's actually Nepal's uh, national flower. And it's the only species of rhododendron that you find south of the Himalayas is in the Nilgiris, oh. uh, in, the, in the Western Ghats of the high reaches. Uh, in, in this place called Bhavani. So you get these beautiful rhododendron plants, the flowers were in bloom, etc. And we were driving towards this spot uh, where we were going to do our research. And uh, it was early, early morning, so it's 7.30 in the morning. And the sun had just risen on those beautiful grasslands. And it, my wildest dream, I never thought I'd ever get to see this, but suddenly, um, suddenly the person in the back of me said, tiger, tiger. And we were like, what? And right in the grassland, guys, in the higher reaches of the Nilgiris, against these rhododendron trees, which you oh. don't see in any other landscape, a absolutely humongous male tiger sitting and watching us through this thicket. It was just a sight to see. Now, I had to 
position the, the tiger at the, right at the bottom of the frame because I wanted to show a bit of that rhododendron flower. That was the thing of the composition. Otherwise, I would have probably placed it slightly higher in the frame. But I wanted to show the speciality about this picture, showing rhododendron and a tiger. I don't think anyone has a picture as yet of rhododendron and tiger in the same frame. And it was just incredible to see. But just look at the size of this guy. I think because of that high altitude, that hilly terrain, etc., they and the cold, they grow a lot larger. They're much more furry. or mm. uh, they, they just seem to be a much larger cat out there. And it was one... Incredible time. You know what this guy, I, I shot, I think, 400 images of this tiger. 398 were of him looking like this. <laughs> again, one, once again, a, a, a cat that is completely out of a tourism zone, the behavior is totally different. They're so inquisitive. Like for the initially, after that, they get very scared and run away quickly. But initially, they, they think that you haven't seen it. So you're just, you're just staring back, you're just looking, 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 looking. And that's all I was photographing it like that. So it was, it was one crazy, crazy sighting that I had to have. Another super special sighting that I had was when I was doing a research trip in the Tengu Marada area of Satya Mangalam Tiger Reserve. So another beautiful special access area that I got to go on my Masya research. And man, 4, 4.50 in the evening, 5 o'clock in the evening. Once again, it's a tiger reserve. It's probably Tamil Nadu's newest tiger reserve. But very, very few um, uh, direct sightings of tigers happen at any time. There's lots of tigers. Camera trapping evidence shows the same, but they're super, super elusive over here. But I got to see this amazing sighting once again of a tiger in Satya Mangalam, which I think is the first uh, DSLR shot of a, of a tiger from Satya Mangalam um, uh, in the recent past at least. And what's special about this picture is also these purple flowers mm -hmm. that are only found in that region called Solarian. So these, these really cool flowers that you get to see along, again, rhododendron in the earlier picture and these really cool purple flowers that you see in this particular thing of this, of this tiger from Satya Mangalam. But you know what, guys? Another cool thing about Satya Mangalam is if you ever go out there and you know, so where we stay is a little anti-poaching camp right on the outside of the Moya River. It's, a, mm. it's one crazy experience to go and experience research, basically, okay? So we're stay, staying at this anti-poaching camp. Obviously, it's very basic. You... you uh, you have to really rough it out quite a bit. So in Tengumarada village, there's a, there's a, there's a little uh, cafe that serves food. So we had to drive across the river in the car, go grab our food and come back to the anti poaching camp. So we had done that one evening to go and get dinner. And all of a sudden, walking in the middle of the road was this amazing hyena. Wow. So um, it, was, it was my first sighting of a hyena in South India. I don't think... Um, I, there are a lot of people who reported hyenas in Mudumalai and parts of the dry regions of Bandipur, but I was my first sighting of a hyena there. But you know what, guys? Now I've been to Satyamangalam now on four, four or five research trips, and every time I've seen hyena there, I think it's got one of the best populations of striped hyena anywhere in South India that I've probably visited. And I've visited quite a few places in South India, but this part of Satyamangalam is really, really rich in hyena population. I was there two weeks ago, and we saw four hyenas uh, once again over there. So that it's an amazing population out there to go out for hyenas. I think if you want to see hyenas, otherwise you'd have to go to Gujarat, the Velavadar, or even Rantambo has got some great hyena sightings. But uh, in South India, very, very, very few places that you can actually guarantee yourself. I think Satya Mangalam is definitely one super place to go for. So yeah, these are my, these are my sort of travels in these regions of the park. But going back to the heart of the Western Ghats, in the recent years, the things that have really, really started to lure me in is not the tigers, leopards, and black panthers and all that, but the smaller creatures like frogs. Yes. I absolutely yeah. love frogs. It's, it's a thing that was introduced to me by an amazing guy called Sachin Rai. So Sachin is a very, very devoted photographer, a close friend of mine, uh, a very passionate guy on, on, on especially frogs and snakes, etc. And he really drove me into this wonderful world of frogs. And I really owe all my frog knowledge, the little that I know, thanks to him. And um, man, when I got introduced to this, I was blown away. And now over the recent years, I started to travel and try to find uh, species that I want on my checklist. But I go to parts of Kurg where I saw this beautiful lateralis um, uh, tree frog. Uh, of course, I've gone to another beautiful place in the Western Ghats called KMTR, which is the Kalakad Budantarai Tiger Reserve. Once again, not for tigers, but to look for frogs over there. I went for another frog, which I couldn't find, unfortunately, but I saw this really special frog called the Bobin Giri uh, bush frog, uh, which is a cool frog as well to see. 
um, really beautiful colors on it and uh, very, very stunning to look at. And of course, um, I go up to the Nilgiris to see this beautiful looking frog, not, not really in terms of colors, but look at the, the way its eyes, the pattern of the pattern of the eyes are. It's got these lovely star-like formation on its eyes, in fact, called the starry-eyed bush frog or the Rauchester Signotis, which is a really, really beautiful frog to see. Then whenever I go to Valparai to visit Prakash and visit all my friends out there, or even go on a photo tour, I always go looking for these two particular frogs. One, of course, is the pseudo Malabaricus. So the, 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 you know, this, this is a particular gliding frog that you, a lot, lot of people mistake to be the Malabar gliding frog that you find in other regions of, say, Western Ghats like Wainad and Kug, etc. This is uh, the Rakophorus pseudo Malabaricus. It's a subspecies that you only find in the, uh, in the Anamalai Hills that you find in that region, uh, a beautiful uh, gliding frog that you get there. But also another cool frog called the Jairam's bush frog. Mm -hmm. Now, the Jairam's bush frog is one of those beautiful frogs. Again, it's got that lovely green color, yellow legs, etc. But what's special about this picture is it's calling. It's a, it's, a, it's a male with its vocal sac out trying to lure a female. So that's what you find the frogs as well. When you're going looking for them with a low uh, intensity torch, you, you listen first. You don't go and put your torch looking for the frog. You first walk along these bushes and you listen. When the frog starts, you hear this tick, 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 tick. You hear that lovely call. I think for everyone listening who's gone to the rainforest, this will sound like music to your ears. So it's that tick, 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 the whole time. And you look, once then you put your torch on and look for it. And then you find these beautiful looking creatures out there. And these, these are, these are this tiny, I um, mean, really, yep. really tiny frog. So they're really, really, really crazy to look at. And it's, it's stunning to see. Um, also, another fun fact about this Jairam's bush frog, it's the only species of creature or of animal found in India that's been named after a photographer. Oh, yeah. So that's cool for us as photographers out here. It's the only one that's named after a photographer from Coimbatore. So yeah, so this is some of the frogs. But in the process of finding frogs, you also come across some amazing other macro life. Like I'm sure you, you're going to introduce a lot of great macro photographers on these beautiful interviews that you do. And I'm sure you're going to see a lot more, but you will come across some amazing snakes like the Malabar Pit Viper, and if you're not looking for macro stuff in the night, you can go out and look for some amazing creatures of the rainforest during the day. So that's the beauty of, of going out to a rainforest. The whole day, you can keep yourself occupied. Not only for, like I said, the stuff at night, but if you go out in the day, you could go looking out for some amazing things like lion tail macaques uh, out in Valparai or even parts of Sirsi and uh, other parts of the Western Ghats as well. Or if you go to certain other regions of the Western Ghats, you'd even go looking for this amazing mountain goat called the Nilgiri Tar. Another cool thing about this particular picture is that the fact that these flowers in the foreground, you see my affinity for flowers and wildlife is, is quite <laughs> high. I got them with the rhododendron, with the solarium, and now with the Kurinji flower. This, this particular flower blooms only once every 12 years. And uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's amazing that you can go and spend the amazing time with these creatures of the rainforest or even more common animals like a, 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 a giant squirrel, an Indian giant squirrel. On one particular trip that I visited Valparai uh, a, year, a little over a year ago, we came across a flying squirrel. But guys, it wasn't the same flying squirrel that I was used to seeing in Kabini or other parts of the Ghats. This was much smaller. And on closer look, we found out this is the most rare flying squirrel that you can find in India. In fact, it's a squirrel that went, was presumed extinct. It was only rediscovered in 1989 the Travancore flying squirrel, one of the only pictures of this animal in the wild ever. Oh, wow. So this is something that is a, a really, really prize catch. And this is the beauty about visiting places that are off the real regular tourist route. So for all you guys, don't only keep going to those same places one again and again. Try and discover some places around your home itself or um, some really, really nice hotspots out there. This is a really cool thing that you got to see over there in, in Valparai, the Travancore flying squirrel. But also, um, Valparai is, is special because uh, if you come around this time of the year, in the, in the winter, you have a lot of elephants migrating between uh, the Kerala part of the forest uh, into uh, the Polachi side of the forest through Valparai. And you get to see a lot of this uh, movement between elephants through the tea estates. So you can make these very cool conservation type of images of man-animal sort of coexistence and conflict in certain times. Uh, between elephants and man. You can see these elephants walking to the place in a beautiful early morning, uh, in early morning light. So, yeah, guys, apart from mammals, you could also come across some amazing birds like 
uh, the jewel of the rainforest, the, the Malabar Trogan, or uh, a monarch, or even an amazing uh, yellow brown bulbul. So yeah, so basically, um, you can see, even though I've, I've traveled and I've put up pictures on my page to other locations, like I love going to places like Bandhavgar or Rantambore or Kobet, Bharatpur, or even Ladakh, and including foreign countries like Africa and Australia, etc. My heart is always in the, in the Western Ghats, particularly the Nilgiri biosphere. And this is what I want to talk to you all about today and uh, share my experiences with uh, the whole world of uh, the Nilgiri biosphere and give you all a little bit of my uh, cool, some cool stories about my experiences. And I really, really hope you'll enjoy that. Hey, thank you so much, uh, Philip. Uh, I was actually lost in your stories. You know, uh, uh, you're such a fantastic storyteller. And believe me, guys, uh, Philip is a fantastic teacher also. Okay. Uh, his specialty, he conducts a lot of uh, um, uh, the classes, the photography classes and the workshops in this Nilgiri Biosphere for the kids. And yes, of course, for adults also, but, but his specialty is kids. So if you have those kids who wanted to learn about nature, not only the photography, but even again, that, uh, that natural history, the nature, the flowers, uh, everything, uh, the macro now, uh, please do contact Philip. Uh, I'm going to share his Insta handle, Facebook in the description down below. Thank you so much, buddy. Uh, wish you very, very happy and Merry Christmas and wish you very Bye. happy Merry Merry Christmas Christmas. You guys as well. Yeah, over to you, Moon, sir. Uh, Philip. Now I realize why kids love to come to with you. <laughs> the story that you tell is just amazing. Just, so I was just uh, hearing your stories. It was just thank you, awesome. Mohan. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so yeah. much for this wonderful presentation. We loved it. And uh, thank you so much. And wish you a very Merry Christmas in advance. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amit. Thank you, Mohan. And uh, I hope that 2021 is going to be a great year for all of us. Uh, let's get, let get um, this virus away from all of us and hope that all of us uh, get to travel like we used to. And uh, may the photography flame keep burning on and on and on. Thank you, guys, so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.